Joining me now, Ian Milheiser, senior correspondent for Vox, where he focuses on the Supreme Court and the Constitution. He's also the author of The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. Ian, thank you very much for coming to the Saturday Show. Thank you. A lot of cases I want to get to in the little time that we have. So, first, there is Trump versus the United States. This is his claim of presidential immunity. Right. How do we think that's going to go? I mean, I think Trump's already won this case. Like, what the court is probably going to do is they're going to say presidents sometimes have immunity and send the case back, back, back down to the lower court to figure out if Trump does in this case. But none of that matters. Like, the, the issue is, are we going to have a trial before for the election, and they've already run out the clock so much that I think that the answer is going to be no. Okay. Fisher versus the United States. This is whether January 6 participants, including Trump, can be charged with obstruction of right. an official proceeding. How do we think? Are they going to throw? Are they going to throw out these charges? I, I mean, I was very surprised at how the oral argument went. There have been like 16 judges who have heard this claim, and only two of them have said that the statute should be read narrowly so these January 6 defendants essentially get off. Now we're talking about there's about 1,200 January 6 defendants, including Donald Trump, and only about. 300 of them have been charged under the statute at issue here. So it's not like it's going to be blanket immunity for January 6th mm -hmm. defendants, but we're, we're talking about a good chunk of people who participated in the insurrection. All right. So then the next uh, uh, couple of cases have to do with abortion. Mm -hmm. um, the Mifa Pristone case. Yeah. How, how do you think the justices are going to rule on that? So that is, you know, of the two abortion cases, that's the one I'm most optimistic about. I think that... that they'll leave it alone. They'll I, leave access to Mifid Pristone. That, that's correct. I mean, almost half of, more than half of abortions in the United States are performed with Mifid Pristone. And I think they realize that if they accept the lower court's reasoning to ban it, so many other drugs would be banned. Look, th these guys don't like abortion, but they don't want to ban antibiotics. Mm -hmm. All right. And so so that's the good news on, right. on abortion there. Thank you. Thank you for the hope, Ian. <laughs> Don't now, worry, I'll spoil it in just a exactly. second. Exactly. And this is with Moyle versus the United States. And this is whether federal law regulating hospitals trumps local abortion bans when it comes to performing emergency abortions. Right. You think the court is going to do what? I mean, I'm worried about this case. So there's a federal law. It doesn't refer specifically to abortions, but it says if you go to an emergency room the, and you have a medical emergency, they have to stabilize your health condition. And so if the appropriate treatment is an abortion, the law right now says that you have a right to an abortion. Right. I think, based on the oral argument, they're likely to write that out of the statute or at least put some kind of limits on it so that people who need life-saving or health-saving abortions won't be able to get them anymore. Um, and now, here's a case that I don't think a lot of people even know about. And this is euphemistically known as the Chevron case. Right. And this is one, whether to overturn the landmark Supreme Court ruling in the 1984 Chevron case that gave federal agencies leeway to interpret the law. Right. Sounds very dry, Ian, but explain why this, this case, to your mind, yeah. is the most important case decision to come yeah. down from the Supreme Court. This is both the most hyper-technical, like <laughs> even lawyers to have trouble understanding a case, but also the most important. So there are just scads of federal laws that delegate power to a federal agency, you know, everything from like how much emissions come from power plants to what your cable rates are to who gets overtime pay is controlled by federal agencies. Chevron was a case from the Reagan era, which said that courts should generally let agencies do what they need to do and defer to them. What the court is likely to do here is essentially give itself a veto power over everything the agencies do. So it's not just it's a huge transfer of power and it's a huge transfer of power from the Democratic Biden administration to a Supreme Court that is a six to three Republican majority. And would that have, to, to your point about, you know, regulating right. you know, an, antibiotics, that, that would give them um, purview over the FDA, right? Potentially. I mean, it, it is a different, the, the FDA has its own statute, which is different than the regulatory regime that, that concerns Chevron. But what we've seen from the Supreme Court overall, they've been making up all these things with names like the major questions doctrine. Yeah, yeah the that, stuff they've made up. Yeah, that lets them interfere with agencies. So, like, this court wants to have the last word on a lot of things. Okay, last word, 10 right. seconds. In the U.S. versus Rahimi case, this is allowing domestic right. abusers to have access to firearms. Will the Supreme Court make that happen? Let that happen? I yes. think they realized they screwed up. They handed okay. down a big pro-gun decision. It led to this decision. I think they're going to have to walk it back. Ian, you've given us hope on two cases. <laughs> Ian Milheiser, thank you very much for coming to the thank Saturday you. show. It's an eventful day for President Biden in Paris.
French President Emmanuel Macron honored Biden and the First Lady with a state visit meant to underscore the strong French and American partnership on global security issues. The two presidents attended a wreath-laying ceremony at the Arc de Triomphe in Paris and a state dinner at the Élysée Presidential Palace. And earlier this week, Biden and Macron attended ceremonies in Normandy marking the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion that turned the tide against Nazi Germany in the Second World War. In remarks, President Biden thanked the veterans who were there, some of them 100 years old, thanked them for their bravery and heroism. And he highlighted the importance of American democracy during an, another speech the next day at the Pointe du Hoc Memorial. We talk about democracy, American democracy. We often talk about the ideals of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. What we don't talk about is how hard it is. American democracy asks the hardest of things, to believe that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. So democracy begins with each of us. It begins when one person decides there's something more important than themselves. Joining me now, former Congressman David Jolly, an MSNBC political analyst, and Alencia Johnson, political strategist and senior advisor for Biden's 2020 presidential campaign. Thank you both very much for coming to this, uh, the Saturday show. Thanks for coming back, David. Welcome, Alencia. But David, I'm going to start with you. Talk about the importance of President Biden's tribute to American soldiers in, um, uh, for D-Day. Jonathan, that was really a remarkable moment for an American president at Pont du Hoc, recognizing the valor and courage of Americans and, and service members from around the globe that fought for freedom, doing so in a spot that is immediately recognizable. And the reason it was so powerful was not just Joe Biden's words. I mean, it fits perfectly his ethos and his political message about the soul of America and the importance of freedom in the West. But I couldn't help but contrast that with pictures of Donald Trump at Helsinki, where he sided with Russia, mm -hmm. where he questioned our own democracy. And then you bring in the events of January 6th, the contrast between what Joe Biden did right there as an American president recognizing freedom on the world stage, but speaking to every American voter about the importance of their freedom right here at home that is under threat, the contrast between that and Donald Trump just made for that moment to be that much more remarkable. And, and you know, Lindsay, I would love to get your thoughts on, on the president's speech and whether it resonates with the American people, the voters back at home. But I have to say, watching those veterans, particularly the African-American veterans who were there, just how poignant yeah. that moment was for them. But your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, he showed strength. He showed that what America should look like as a global leader, right? Something that symbolizes democracy. I do think it resonates with a segment of American voters, veterans, those hopefully in the armed forces, those who actually understand the history, right? You know, the Biden campaign is tempering with younger voters who, quite frankly, have grown up with a Barack Obama, Donald Trump. They don't connect as much with some of this as older voters do. However, showing his force there, showing his strength there, juxtaposed with how Donald Trump looks with world leaders and which world leaders Donald Trump cozies with, right. I think that is going to play well for President Biden here as we get closer to Election Day. Uh, David, NBC News reports that Donald Trump has narrowed the list to between three and four picks. You see them right there. North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum and Senators Marco Rubio of Florida, Tim Scott of South Carolina, and J.D. Vance of Ohio. Uh, all of them were critical of Trump at one point or another, David. But what, what is Trump looking for in a vice president this time around? Uh, someone to say yes and someone to notionally not detract from his ticket. Or in the case of Burgum, somebody that could write a really big check to support Donald Trump's campaign. And look, I think um, what Burgum has going for him is we could go all the way to November before the nation actually knows who this guy is. I mean, clearly, maybe he's a very nice guy. We saw him try to be somewhat reasonable during the, the primary. We know he is, has high marks as governor. But Donald Trump is looking for somebody to fall in line. Marco Rubio has long been my dark horse, who's now moved up. I guess he's in the final four, simply because he played the politics of Donald Trump right. He didn't relitigate his flip-flop for the last eight years. He just flopped, and he owned it, <laughs> and he didn't try to do it in front of the press. He just owned it. Um, and, and he reminds Nikki Haley voters 
that there are people like Nikki Haley still supporting Donald Trump. But look, the vice president is not going to change. The vice presidential nominee is not going to change Donald Trump's behavior, nor the party's platform. What the country should hope for is somebody capable of governing should Donald Trump end up not being able to serve. Um, and so, Alencia, of, of those four people, uh, who do you think is <laughs> who do you think he's going to pick? I mean, they're all kind of yeah, crapshoot. However, I think he might pick someone like Tim Scott, given that it gives diversity on the ticket. Alencia, oh, seriously, I, I mean, look, you really think he cares air about quotes. diversity? <laughs> they have been trying to run black candidates in certain areas. The Republicans are trying to get away from being called the party full of white supremacists and racists. So Tim Scott falls in line and he happens to be a black man. Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I heard you get hey, kind Jonathan, of, Jonathan. Yeah, go ahead. Uh-huh. I heard there's an awesome new book written by Jonathan Capehart that's about to drop. Maybe I'll bet Alencia that it's not Tim Scott, and the wager will be the new Capehart book. <laughs> well, that book's not coming out until May of next year, knock on wood. That's fine. So, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Oh, you know, David, thank you very much. That's very, that's very well, nice of you. But in the little seconds that we have left, I'm going to get us back on topic and say this. The one thing I know, we all know about Donald Trump, is that he is based on appearances. He gave somebody the Def Department of Defense secretary job because he looked the part. And so of those four characters we saw before, Governor Burgum looks the part. To Donald Trump's mind, that is. The little time I've spent in, in, in <laughs> his head. Former Congressman David Jolly. Alencia Johnson, <laughs> thank you both very much for coming to the Saturday show. Tomorrow, another dubious first for Donald Trump. The disgraced former president is scheduled for a virtual interview with a New York probation officer. The interview is required as part of Trump's pre-sentencing report after being found guilty on all 34 counts in his Manhattan criminal trial. Today, Trump was in Las Vegas for his first official rally since his conviction. And once again, the perpetually aggrieved Queens-born builder played the victim and projectionist as he falsely accused the Biden administration of doing things we all know he's just itching to do if he gets another chance in the White House. The only way he can get elected is to cheat. But this time they're using weaponization of Department of Justice, go in to see the local DAs, go in to see the attorney generals to cheat. Uh-huh. Joining me now, former Republican Congressman Joe Walsh of Illinois, now an independent and director of The Social Contract. Former Congresswoman Donna Edwards of Maryland and an MSNBC political analyst. And Andrew Desiderio, senior congressional reporter at Punchbowl. Thank you all very much for coming back to The Sunday Show. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave you out of this right now, Andrew. <laughs> um, Joe and Donna, your, your reaction to Donald Trump saying the only way he can get elected is to cheat. He's saying that about President Biden. I love to be with you on this set, on this show, and we have fun. Jonathan, this is, in, this is scary, and this is dangerous, and I don't want to smile, and I don't want to laugh about it. There was an insurrection three and a half years ago that he incited, and he's doing the same damn thing this year. He's lying to his voters, and Jonathan, he wants there to be violence again if he loses. We can't normalize this. Mm -hmm. Donna, I'm, just, I'm assuming you agree. Look, I, I totally agree with what Joe has said here, and I mean, I think the scary part about this is that it's not only Donald Trump, but it's all of his surrogates who are echoing the same uh, wah, wah, wah about the election. And I think while it would be fun to, you know, laugh and smile about this, this is really serious and can lead to real violence again, yet mm -hmm. again. Uh, let's, um, I want to show what a Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York had to say on Fox News Life, Liberty, Levin um, about she said the trial was rigged and is shredding our democracy, yada, yada, yada. Just, just play it. This is uh, shredding our democracy. The mainstream media and Democrats accuse the right, but it's really Democrats who are attacking our democracy. And the American people know that the, it, this was rigged from the start, and it is an affront to us. President Trump is correct that the real verdict will be rendered this November on Election Day, when President Trump wins overwhelmingly. And so, and so, Andrew, I played that because 
you know, everyone's talking about four men who are potentially on Donald Trump's short list. But to my mind, what we, who we just saw, that, to my mind, is who I think Donald Trump is going to pick, at least, at least Stefanik. Does that hold any water in, in what you're hearing around the Capitol? Yeah, for sure. I was just going to say Veep audition right there, right? right? You see many of these uh, potential running mates for Donald Trump going on TV, rushing to defend him uh, in these various cases and advancing some of the same arguments. I agree with you that she is probably a top contender. Um, on Capitol Hill, the conversation usually centers around people like Senator Tim Scott right. or Senator J.D. Vance. Uh, some conversations involve Senator Marco Rubio as well. Uh, there's that question of him having Florida residency and President Trump having right. Florida residency and, you know, this arcane rule where the, the, the top of the ticket and the vice presidential nominee can't be from the same state technically. So how do you address that issue constitutionally? Uh, so, but he is in the conversation. You know, look, Elise Stefanik is out there doing this because she wants to be Trump's vice presidential uh, nominee, right? She was someone who came up in the Republican Party as someone who was viewed as a sort of a moderate, moderate uh, right. someone who was going to change the face of the party. She started this organization. Uh, I believe it was called Winning for Women. It was a, a Republican women's group that was supporting uh, candidates across the country that were sort of more moderate, more centrist, talking about issues that are more appealing to suburban women voters, for example, that Republicans uh, have lost out on in the last few elections. And you see her transformation sort of in real time here. Yeah, huge transformation. You invoked the name of another person auditioning for, for Trump's VP, and that's Senator Tim Scott. Listen to what he said on Fox News. About, just listen to what he claims won't happen if Donald Trump wins re-election. Protecting law and justice is job one for President Trump. He will not target his political opponents. He will fire Merrick Garland and restore confidence in the Department of Justice. For real, Joe, he, he will not target his political opponents. But this week, all he said was, oh, you know, I might have to get revenge. Come on. Jonathan, I served with Tim Scott. Every time Donna, he speaks, I don't recognize who he is. Uh, to Andrew's point, I don't know who the VP pick is going to be, but it's going to be somebody who's going to have to lie about the election and say that Donald Trump is a victim right now of a weaponized Justice Department. That's the job requirement. Donna, what do you Look, think? Uh Tim Scott is just like all of these um, Republican uh, VP wannabes, and they are going down to the very bottom to defend Donald Trump, to say that he's saying things that he doesn't say. I mean, Donald Trump himself has said how he's going to weaponize the Department of Justice. We're not making that up. Those are his own own words. And so I think that um, these Republicans are trying to clean up Donald Trump's act, but it's really not working. Uh, I want to squeeze in one more um, <laughs> potential VP nominee, and this is um, Florida Congressman Byron Donalds at the town hall event. This is, uh, I changed my mind, control room, not element seven, element six. Um, watch this. During Jim Crow, the Black family was together. During Jim Crow, more Black people were not just conservative, because Black people always have been conservative-minded, but more Black people voted conservatively. Now, the, the congressman went on with Reverend Sharpton uh, ye yesterday, and they got into, you know, shouting match with, with Byron Donalds, saying, I didn't say that. I'm not going to sit here and have you lie on me. We just... We just saw that, Donna. Why? Can you? <laughs> right? Donald, Donald Trump, I mean, uh, Byron Donalds posted the video himself of himself saying that uh, during Jim Crow, over 4,000 fathers, brothers, mothers, sisters were uh, lynched. During Jim Crow, people's rights were taken uh, taken away from them. During Jim Crow, uh, black families were terrorized all across the South. Uh, Byron Donalds, I don't know what vision of America he's living, version of America he's living in, but it's not a version that many of our parents and grandparents experienced. And, you know, I'm going to just give a, a, a shout out to my colleague, Joy Reid, who really did a masterful job interviewing him and pointing out all, all, all those things you just did, Donna.
Let's start with the breaking news out of Israel, where a key rival of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, um, opposition leader Benny Gantz, just resigned from Israel's war cabinet. What could this mean for, for ceasefire negotiations? I hope it puts more pressure on Netanyahu to agree to his own government's proposal for a ceasefire agreement that President Biden has been championing. Uh, I think the loss of Gantz really fractures unity in Israel at a time where it desperately needs it. But I do think it's going to put, and I hope it does, political pressure on Netanyahu to end the fighting and the killing uh, and come to an agreement so the hostages can be released and civilians can try to restore their their lives. Uh, hundreds of Palestinians were killed in the raid that rescued those four Israeli hostages yesterday. How might that impact ceasefire negotiations? Well, I think the initial response, obviously, in Israel is joy and celebration uh, at the release of four hostages who have been there for eight months uh, in the tender loving mercies of Hamas. That is to be celebrated. But the loss of life incurred in doing that is something that I, I think uh, is horrifying. And I, I would hope uh, that uh, the Israeli military and the Israeli government uh, take a moment of reflection about the high costs of their operations generally mm -hmm. in Gaza. And one, one more question uh, on Israel before we turn um, to domestic issues. There's also talk of opening up another front in the north to, do, to deal with Hezbollah and, and Lebanon. Would that be a wise thing for Israel to do? I'm not a military advisor, but I think Israel has its hands full right now with the operations in Gaza and the occupation of the West Bank to open up really a third front uh, on the Lebanese border with Hezbollah, I think would really tax the Israeli military uh, in ways that, uh, you know, go back to rivaling, say, the War of 1973. Uh, and I hope it can be avoided. So let's turn our attention stateside. McKay Coppins of The Atlantic reports on how terrified Europe is about a second, a second Trump presidency, writing, quote, one word came up again and again when I asked European officials about the stakes of the American election. Um, existential. Uh, but here's what Senator Tom Cotton had to say about ending the current war on European soil in Ukraine. Watch this. The way to have peace in Europe, and for that matter, peace and stability around the world, is to remove Joe Biden from the White House on Election Day this year and retur return Donald Trump. That's okay, how we'll get back to peace and stability. Congressman, why shouldn't Europeans be afraid with comments like that? Uh, they should be, and they are. Um, I have been very involved in NATO, uh, in the Parliamentary Assembly, the legislative arm of NATO, uh, for the last decade plus, and I can tell you I've never seen the Europeans as anxious about American politics as they are right now. Um, everything's at stake, and as you indicated in your opening, NATO, ironically, has worked. It's kept the peace for most of 80 years. It's the one thing Putin respects. He will not cross the NATO border because of Article 5 that says an attack on one is an attack on all of us, and we mean it. Uh, and he's respected that. He's respected nothing else in this war but that. So to actually call into question the viability and the utility and the efficacy of NATO when it's working and we've got a war going on is really reckless. Uh, and I, would, I don't think any European is going to turn to Tom Cotton for advice uh, as we go forward. And we should point out that Article 5 has been invoked only once in NATO's, in NATO's history, and that was to protect the United States after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. That's right. Uh, meanwhile, far-right parties made significant gains in European parliamentary elections today, so much so that French President Macron announced today that he would dissolve the, nation, the, na the nation's parliament and call for snap elections. And this is significant because his current term does not end until 2027. Are the far-right forces uh, gaining record support in Europe as much a threat as a Trump 2.0 in Washington? I think there's a lot of variety among what is generically called the right in Europe. Uh, and, you know, the right in Italy is very different than the right in Germany and Austria and, and on and on. Um, I, obviously, it's alarming to see these kinds of far-right parties make gains in European elections. European elections sometimes are kind of a 
a, a second vote for Europeans, so they might not vote for those people to govern their own country, but it's kind of a free vote to send them to Brussels. It's a way of expressing dissatisfaction with the status quo. Obviously, it reflects deep concern about the immigration issue in Europe, and we have to take note of that and respect, uh, respect that as a potent issue going forward. A potent issue in Europe, but does that also mean that is we should Americans should look at what's happening in Europe, American officials look at what's happening in Europe and take heed? Yes, I, 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 we can't afford to ignore what's happening in Europe. It doesn't necessarily mean that exactly that will happen here, but it doesn't mean nothing. Uh, it's resonating with voters, and we've got to take cognizance of that. Jerry Connolly uh, of Virginia, member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and senior member of the House Oversight Committee. As always, thank you very Thanks, much Jonathan. for coming to the Sunday show.